Hello, fellow travelers. Welcome to Fate's Wide Wheel. I'm your host, Sam Fain, and it is my incredible pleasure and privilege to be joined on this episode by none other than Dr. Ben Song himself, Raymond Lee. Raymond, thank you so much for being here. I am so happy to be here and to be talking to you. Yeah, that's I'm just yeah, I'm thrilled. Uh, this is uh, amazing. And it feels like it's something that I've wanted to do for so long. And so the fact that it's actually happening now, I have to, you know, focus and get my my good questions in order so that I don't just sit here and stare for a while. <laughs> well, set your expectations super low. Um, this might be one of the most uninteresting interviews you, you might have ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I highly doubt that. But I guess if we if we both set our exp expectations low, then neither one of us will be disappointed. That's sort of my motto. I uh, <laughs> just <laughs> very low bar. Anything that exceeds it, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> well, I just have to say, I think you've been exceeding the bar for quite a while now. And uh, I am just so in awe of your work on the show. And I'm so thrilled that I have gotten to know that part of you over the past year and a half um, as the show's been airing. And I think that this season in particular has just been such a phenomenal ride and so moving and something that has has, I think, really engaged with me personally and with the audience in general on a level that um, there's just not a lot of television out there right now that's doing that, if any, quite frankly. So thank you for that. Thank you. And I love that our show stands for that. And I, and I love that our show can be a, a light. Um, that's one of my favorite things about doing this show is that we're always trying to present a positive perspective, you know, just, yeah. and you can't ever take too many high roads. <laughs> this finale, <laughs> yes. I thought of anything with all the payoff is like, you can always choose a, a, a better option. Absolutely. And I think that that was definitely one of the things that moved me the most. And I mentioned this actually, um, I think when I when I was talking to Chris Grismer and I and I had spoken to Drew Lindo about this as well recently, and I'm very open about these things on the podcast. I was in therapy and I was talking to my therapist and I mentioned to him that I felt like there was this tidal wave of emotion that was hanging over me and it was tied to so many things, you know, including the passing of Matt Dale and, uh, you know, my father passed last year and there's just been a lot of stuff that's been going on and a lot of other changes and a lot of other things that, you know, I felt like had been thrown at me and yet I wasn't able to really let the the emotion drop and in watching the finale there was a moment when i i, I uh, was able to see it early uh this past saturday there was a moment where i felt like that tidal wave started to fall and there's more work that needs to be done quite frankly of course wow. but just watching the the show and especially the moment where ben is about to you know bring the hammer down on the computer and then notices the name and steps back and everything shifts in that moment and it, it really was exactly what I needed. And I think on a larger level, it's exactly what, not to sound too grandiose, the world needs right now. Um, and obviously, you know, you have a wonderful script, you know, you have everything set up, but uh, for you in that moment, um, what was that about to you and what did it mean to you? In that particular moment, with Jeffrey's machine. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, just sort of touching on the things that you've said, I, you know, we're, we're coming out of some really intense times. Um, the pandemic is something that is uh, completely exceptional in our lifetime. Um, for us actors and everybody in the industry, the, the strike was, I mean, I have friends who have lost homes. Um, I lost some really close family members in the during the shooting of uh, the Quantum Leap both seasons. You know, we're all dealing with a lot and we're all expected to still put on a brave face and go about our day because there are people that are in our lives that need us and we need to show up for them. And when you're working on a show like this that is consistently making you a better person you know ben song sets an example for me as much as addison does as much as ian does jen magic that these are the types of 
role models and figures that I wanted to have growing up in my life. And in reading what these characters have to say and what they're doing, I, I get to learn about how to make positive choices. And it just kind of, in this existence, you sort of, one informs the other, the person informs the art and the art informs you. And sometimes roles find you when they need, when they need you and you find roles when something spiritually syncs up with that. And I, my favorite things to hear is that this show can be a salve to those who are in, who are hurt and who are in need of it. And, you know, uh, I've heard Ray Charles's voice be described as uh, honey on sandpaper or something like that. And and it's a beautiful sound, right? And it's the realest sound. And in our, in a lot of ways, in our, in our wild universe of quantum leap, we still get to make a lot of sense because of the human connections that we're able to build in it. And this show allows me to invest and reinvest in those I love. And you know, uh, it just it just informs me a lot. Um, but in that specific moment with his machine, uh, I had to just remember that Ben is again making the decision to go with his gut. There's, there's some, I know this is that, but destroying something is never right. Um, and Ben in all of his optimism can always choose to save everybody at once in his mind, right? He can, he can, he can do it all. Um, it's one of the things that we nigh look up to him for the fact that he is willing to take on as much responsibility as, as possible. And somehow, you know, in his mind, he's, he's doing the right thing. So it was another moment where destruction's not it. Killing isn't it. He is by nature a pacifist, whether he has endowed that or not, or whether he truly believes it. But I mean, enough people say that about you, it must be true, right? And I, and it's another moment where he's like, I, I, I can't imagine that crushing this, this kid's, everything that he built, his life's work up to that point is going to be the way out that just didn't feel right. Ben says, this doesn't feel right. And yeah. You know, it, it wasn't much more than just a gut feeling of this isn't it in that moment. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that. And I, I agree. I think that the, the the world that we inhabit and in our lifetimes, what we've seen, you know, you go back over the past 25 years and just think about all of these huge events. And I, and I think it's true for most generations. I mean, there are those those touchstone events that happen that really shape your worldview. And so many of the things that have occurred, you know, I think in our lifetimes and and because we're of similar age and, and in particular over these past 25 years have really caused this this split over the way that people handle certain situations and choosing to respond with empathy and compassion versus responding with that you know that that knee jerk you, you know spark of violence or hatred um is, is one of the things i think that that does separate us so much these days and it's so easy to do one and not the other and so <clears throat> the sh the show one of the things that i think is so beautiful about the show is that it reminds us that doing the other, that responding with empathy and compassion, it might be difficult, but it's always going to be the best choice. Um, what, is it, what does it mean to you personally, uh, at the risk of repeating what you just said, of course, to be kind of be a part of that message and, and be sort of the, you know, the vessel of that message in so many ways, because Ben is, is, is the one that we see making those choices so often. You know, um, I'm, I'm often asked about like the pressures and the responsibility of carrying a show. I think the bigger pressure and the bigger responsibility is to carry the, the values of Ben, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the values of the show is the bigger responsibility, honestly. And then to show, to be that consistently in my life is the bigger responsibility. Um, you know, I've, I've been acting for 15 years. My first acting class was 20 years ago. You know, it's the acting part. I was never really worried about 
just in terms of what the role is, but to show up in my daily life, because I, I want to practice what I preach, right? Like, I don't want to just be Ben Song when the cameras are up and not be that <laughs> everywhere else. And, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I, I think trying to live up to what the show means has, has been my biggest challenge over the past two years. And I I've been lucky in the, in my last two, in my last two jobs, uh, I've had to evaluate the person that I was because it was my previous show was just about an awful husband. Right. Right. I wasn't that husband, but it was about an awful (laughs) husband. And I, at that time, I had to evaluate what my relationship to my wife and my family was in the best way. It's like, have I been Al Bundy my whole life? Or have I been, you know what I mean? Like, who are these sitcom dads that I grew up with? And uh, is that, is that the way that we've just sort of been indoctrinated to be like, just kind of like just lazy and like not helpful and to just make fun of their wives and kids, you know, like I had to take a good hard look at myself. Um, this show made me take a good hard look in myself and have I always been choosing empathy? Have I always been taking the high road? Have I been, have I listened? Do I listen first before responding? Um, and it's, the show has helped me become a better person, (laughs) you know? And so how it feels to, to carry all of this, it it, it feels like, uh, I, 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 I have to, choose to make the positive choice every time. And I'm telling you, and I will tell many others that it will positively impact your life and your relationships and your friendships. If you just can put yourself aside for a second, listen to what the person with the bigger need has to say and to sort of go from there, even if it's like, even if it's five minutes to be with somebody, but to have those five minutes be a quality five minutes, um, is more important than 50 minutes of, I don't know, small talk or whatever. But, um, (laughs) I I feel like I'm sort of, um, flailing here with your question, but, um, no, no, not at all. I mean, I think that that is a wonderful response and I think that it's, it's incredible the way that art can obviously impact the audience. But I think that sometimes the thing that we don't necessarily talk enough about is the way that it impacts the artist, you know, the artists involved and the way that, you know, that that can influence and change your own interpretation of your life and your being. And, and it's not, you know, it's, it's, we, I take that back. We often hear about the dark side, right? You'll hear about, you know, when an actor goes too far or when, you know, when a writer, you know, gets too deep into this or whatever. But I think that the positive influence that it has is, is something that sometimes we take for granted, you know, as artists, right? Like we understand that this is, this is life. Like this is air, you know, to us. Right. But that, that the, the effect that it can have on us and, and, and the way that we can have those experiences that alter our perception um, of, of, you know, our relationships with the other human beings around us is so incredibly important. And I think that you hit on that perfectly. You know, um, I mean, I, I I apologize, listeners, but just to just share this with you for a moment, the show that I'm in right now is about two young mothers. It's called Cry It Out. And these two young mothers, um, you know, getting together and having coffee. And it touches on all sorts of things about class and gender and, 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 and the patriarchy. And, and, and it's, it's just a lovely show. And, and I've learned so much of it. And it's caused me to refocus my own interpretation of the past, you know, five and a half years, six years with my wife and, you know, and her as a mother and her, you know, and, and and, and me as a father and, and, and just the way that that affects us and touches us. So I completely, I completely understand it. And I, and I do, I think it's valuable information to put out there because it's um, it's powerful and, and, and it, it is for the audience as well as the artist. So, I mean, I know that the show has affected me in, in many positive ways uh, as, as well. I can, I can feel shifts in myself just going back to when the show premiered even, you know, um, and, and kind of touching on something and engaging me and reminding me of something that I had maybe disconnected within myself for a while. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I, I love that our show can be a bridge to those feelings and yeah. to, to, for us to, yeah, be reminded sometimes of, I, I can't, I can't tell you the amount of times that I've read one of our scripts and I'm like, I should text my mom. <laughs> I should check in on my friends. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's a positive influence. 
It absolutely is. And, you know, I mean, we, we've talked about some some wonderful touchy-feely stuff that I love and I love being able to get there and we we went there really quick. So, uh, uh, I'm going to I'm going to pull I'm going to pull it back a little bit now. Uh and, and kind of reorient us. Let's go, we're just getting started. Let's, we'll go, we'll, let's go in. We um, will. We have we'll, we'll be in tears by the time this is over. <laughs> uh, but, but um so it, it, one of the things that's really interesting to me uh is that when you were according to Wikipedia anyway, so correct me if it is wrong. Uh when you were in college, you studied kinesiology for a time before switching to theater and to acting. Um, and I just immediately thought, wow, that is got to be a fascinating, like, point of view to be able to approach the craft of acting from. So I'm curious if that is the case, if if you have used anything that you did learn in the time that you were studying kinesiology as an actor, and just how uh, that might have, you, you know, what also, I guess, what, what shifted, you know, what caused you to change the major, basically? Uh, I do want to address that uh, it's very misleading because uh, when it says <laughs> kinesiology, it sounds like when you read it, it's like, oh, he was uh, about to be a doctor and then he changed professions. <laughs> no, uh, it was I was not good in school and I was at a community college and kinesiology, I thought at the time would be the fastest way to be uh on a, a professional basketball team being like the next Gary Vitti to tape up Shaq's foot. Cause the Lakers mm -hmm. were like my team. I thought that would be my way. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, I just, I took a theater course and it just kind of uh, changed the course of everything. Um, but I did have a deep interest in just the way the human body were. I've been active my whole life. Uh, I've played baseball all throughout growing up and, um, I've just always been a very physical person. And so I had a deep interest in how the human body worked. And that was really the extent of why I wanted to study kinesiology. Um, but that curiosity has not gone away. I still think of acting as a very, um, I equate it the most to sports, actually. I think it's a highly physical mm -hmm. and I think it's highly mental in the way that, um, you know, players can experience slumps in their game and, and things like that. But um, yeah, the, the, the decision to, to move on to theater was really because I found my calling in that theater class. I was like, okay, kinesiology was something that I thought I was interested in but this is something that I know I love. And it's something that I, I know that as a kid that I had an interest in doing it, but not seeing enough of myself reflected on the screen, big and small has kept me away from it. Um, but I was like, you know what? Oh, why not? You know? And I was lucky to have one friend who was two years older than me that I went to high school with. And he, he went on to a university and he took a theater course and he's my background, he's Korean. And I went, I went down to San Diego to watch his um, college production and it just, he didn't have a large role, but just seeing him on stage made me think that this was possible. And mm -hmm. in my mind, he had already made it, you know, he was a, he was a junior in college at that time. And I was like, God, this is a legit pro production of Marat Saad. And I'm like, this is, this is it. And um, <clears throat> that's all I wanted to do. And then I went to Cal State Long Beach and watched a production of, of Titus. There, there, and I was like, this is just incredible. And, and attaching that to my physical nature, you know, I grew up break dancing and stuff and dancing as well too. So like long beach at the time cal state long beach had this incredible i think they still do they, uh, why wouldn't they they have an incredible dance program and it's it was very competitive to get into and so the dancers who couldn't get into the program the overflow would flow into the theater department and therefore they just made incredibly they 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 made with the lack of production just didn't have money they they made up with their physical bodies so everything was a physical piece piece uh, it was you know, light, sound, and movement. And that really resonated with me. And at the time, there was a clown teacher who is now uh, the head of movement at Juilliard. Uh, he had just graduated from Juilliard, and he was looking to relocate to the West Coast to sort of teach and things like that. He came to Long Beach. He taught for three years. Uh, I was lucky enough to catch him those three years and he became our clown teacher, clown and movement teacher. And so I learned commedia and the art of clowning through him, theatrical clowning. Mm -hmm. you, you have a theater background, so you know. And yeah. that was another big 
shift shifting moment of just my trajectory. I'm like, oh, I thought I just wanted to do theater. I thought I was just doing Caucasian chalk circle over here. And then he he introduced me to clowning. All right. Well, this is what I really love because now I get to do every, I get to use everything and I get to connect with an audience before there's a fourth wall. You don't, you don't do that. And then you learn about, you know, how Brecht used to do that and breaking the fourth wall. And then, and then, and then you go on to do clowning and you're like in the audience. And I'm like, this is just so cool. And I, I got to use my entire instrument. And so me and my friends, after graduating, we created a clown troupe. And we toured that clown trip to all the French festivals, <clears throat> all the way from here to Chicago and back. In 2011, we did a we did a full clown tour. Um, wow. We literally packed ourselves into two vans and then just went on. Um, did a hundred shows of our inaugural show, created a company, and then produced ten more productions after that. And that's where I really cut my teeth. Um, yeah. But before I get too in the weeds with like how I got my start in all that kinesiology was basically just kind of my floating around major. <laughs> sure. I like that it's there because people think I'm much smarter than I am <laughs> because of it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I think you're pretty smart. Uh, uh, certainly when it comes to this stuff, because, it, you know, I think that, again, the, you know, the training is, is, is sometimes, you know, something I think they can get a little lost because, you know, people see someone on television or they see someone, you know, on a movie screen and they just kind of think that they've always been there. Right. You know, and, and sure. it's that that whole like overnight sensation thought, too. It's just sort of like, oh, yeah, you know, they, they, they were doing nothing yesterday, but now they're they're famous, they're a star. And, and there's so much work. There's so, so much work. And you mentioned Commedia, which is interesting to me because it, you know, it was something that I studied uh, as well. And, and, and just, you know, learning that the, you know, the, the way that as storytellers, you know, for hundreds and hundreds of years, I mean, thousands of years, really, but for, you know, for hundreds of years, there have been these, like, you know, these, these archetypes, these, 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 you know, these things these, that, that if you do this, then it means this. And, and I think the wonderful thing now, you know, kind of being in this postmodern society, if you will, is that we get to reinterpret a lot of that. So I'm curious, especially like, you know, doing the clowning, taking taking the shows on the road, you know, what opportunities did you have to kind of redefine what some of that meant for you and for, you know, and for your company um, as you were going and, and producing these pieces? Yeah. And, and the, the redefining of that is a very key component because, um, most of the world doesn't know clowning the same way you and I know clowning. They know clowns to be frightening and um, just sort of a sideshow. And yeah, they, they, they can be frightening. There are frightening clowns, you know, there's theater of the grotesque and there, there are place, you know, um, there's buffooning, you know, there are, there are different art forms within clowning where it can be a little bit scary for, for to be scary sake. But the clowning that I know is um, the most innocent parts, right? You're, you have a childlike curiosity and everything is new. One of the main exercises, the first exercises you learn is, Hey, what's that? I don't like that. Nah. Or <laughs> hey, what's that? I like that. And then you go to it and it's discovery, discovery, discovery. And a, a clown is, is the most innocent, in essence, the most innocent being. And I thought that was fascinating. Um, yeah. And I just thought like, and that was, I didn't know at that time how important that nugget um, would be to inform every single role that I approached afterwards, because mm -hmm. it's all about listening. It's all about discovery. It's all about anticipating what your audience is going to feel if you were to present this. And with clowning, you, you, our goal every single time we stepped on stage was to redefine the expectations of what people thought of. They were expecting it, but we gave them children and we gave them uh, a, a story about these children growing up in these archetypes and wh where that would lead them if they stuck with these archetypes. And it was a, basically our opportunity to share, to hold up a mirror to society and say, this is what the world will look like if you stayed children and never grew up out of this, in this archetype. 
Um, and we had a nervous clown, a mischievous clown, an angry clown, and a, and a, and a sad clown. And I was an angry clown. And through childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and death, he has been bullied by his older brother as a child. And adolescence, he just – still the older brother was alive. But he, he follows his older brother into uh, war because he joins the army. Um, and then out of his rage, seeing his brother die, he decides to try to take his own life before like trying to mow down everybody else. And that is if you just only chose the path of being angry. Anyways, so that was that was kind of our show, but that that theme of redefining continues to recur in in my life uh, because in some ways I was sort of hiding behind the mask of a clown because it represented the redefinition that I wanted to do for everybody else being perceived as an Asian is an Asian person that wanted to do things that weren't tied to only telling Asian stories, and so. Once I started doing theater, I wanted to attach myself to playwrights who also wanted to subvert expectations, who also wanted to see themselves, you know, theater of the oppressed is seeing yourself um, putting out a better world than you already are in. And so I wanted to always work with people who wanted to create a, a better reality than the ones that we're living in currently. And so... Uh, I, I attach myself to dreamers, Asian American dreamers. And, you know, this show is no different. We're just, you know, Ben Song is a, a projection of, of somebody always that he can be better than. Um, so, yeah, the redefining is a very big theme in my life. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and I think that is clear. And, and it's fascinating to hear it connected to, you know, your theatrical background. But also, like you said, I mean, I, I think with with Quantum Leap, I mean, even even, you know, with with Kevin could fuck himself, even even with here and now, like, you know, seeing seeing your work in that because before you know, before the show aired, I was like, well, I, I got to get to know, you know, our leaper. So I went back and I watched, <laughs> you know, some stuff. And, and it's fascinating to me, because I, I think one of the things that the care and I'm not saying that this is, you know, intentional necessarily but one of the things that all of these characters have in common because frankly the character in here now does not have a lot in common with ben song but one of the things that, that they do have in common is that that sort of search to redefine themselves on some level right you know i mean in, in, in kevin you know fuck himself i mean the you know getting sober and and and, and dealing you know with, with that and, and reconnecting and um you know and then with here and now it's the same thing dealing with these the these sorts of um the, the traumas of the past and mm -hmm. how they manifest themselves you know in the present and how you can try to get out from under that and, and live a healthier life. And I don't mean like, you know, eat more vegetables, although do, but you know, just, just, just be able to have, uh, make healthy choices and make positive choices that, that allow you to connect with yourself as opposed to disconnecting with yourself at the expense of, you know, other people or other things. Um, you know, one of the things that, uh, early on, I know, uh, I, I think I recall you saying in an interview, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, was that it was so wonderful to see not only Ben Song, you know, of course, being Korean American, but well, not even Korean American, really, because he's an immigrant, you know, he came from Korea to this country. Um, could you talk a little bit about the importance of being able to, to have that be a part of Ben's backstory to you? Yeah, and I I look at Ben Song as the ultimate fish out of water, um, hmm. especially when you find him, uh, you know, at the beginning of the show. He has a blank slate, doesn't remember a thing, and just has to figure it out. And every time he leaps, he has to figure everything out in an instant. And um, although I'm not an immigrant myself, I, I know what it might feel like to be perceived as such and to sort of conduct myself as such. Um, and I think it just added to that theme of being a fish out of water. You know, you're, you're plopped down in a new place and English isn't your first language. So you have to be extremely perceptive. You have to listen more than the normal person would. You also, also having a, a single parent mother, which I do have, uh, I've just had to have a heightened sense of awareness uh, from a very young age. And, you know, my mom still to this day doesn't know how to speak English. So the, uh, you could imagine when I, uh, you know, just to paint a picture, my mom gets 
um, her credit card statement. There's something that she wants to dispute. She can't talk to the credit card company. So my 13 year old self has to dial up the credit card company and be like, Hey, uh, there is something wrong with this bill. Um, and then that was like my whole life growing up. Um, mm. so I think it just further placed Ben in, in, in a place where actually he was put in to succeed because of his past. Um, he had already known how, how to survive, essentially, how to survive in, in a very non-physically threatening sense, uh, because I don't believe Ben uh, as a kid was ever felt like, um, the, at least the, 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 the story that I created for him, he wasn't necessarily bullied, but he always had, had felt othered. Um, but now yes. finding himself leaping, he's always in physical peril. So he just has to use his his intuition and instincts. And, you know, I've always admired uh, stars uh, that were able to do this well. Stars uh, meaning like actors in, in, in roles like Michael J. Fox. Like, you know, it's just by, it's by the seat. He's flying by the seat of his pants figuring it out using his wits not the not the strongest guy by any means but can just figure his way out of things and i just saw ben as being all of that and um him being an immigrant just furthermore made him um uh, another so uh i think that was great for a building block as as a as a characteristic for ben yeah, I'm so glad you use that that word othered because I was literally going to to say that myself. I think that you know when whenever you've been othered, it it, it I think it can shut you off to this, but it can also create that wellspring of empathy because mm -hmm. you, you understand what it is to be set apart, you know, for, for whatever reason to be marginalized. And, you know, one of the things that's so beautiful about the show is how inclusive it is. And it, and that, you know, in and of itself, unfortunately makes it so different from so many other shows on television. Um, how important is that piece of the puzzle to you? And resilient on, on mm. being, being othered helps you become just, you can take a slur, you know, you, you can take a rejection and you can, you can, you know, absorb it or you can choose to spit it back out. And I think what's, and I think that's the definition of empathy, right? If you just absorb it, you just go, okay, okay, you're, you must be going through something or maybe your day is just way worse than mine, but I will absorb that. Or if somebody just doesn't deserve it, you just, you just give it right back to them. But what it teaches you over time is how to become resilient to all of that. Um, and Ben is, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know, know if I, that I answers your question. There. No, no, no. I, I, I know. I, I mean, that is. A, I'm so glad that you added that to the conversation because I do think that that's incredibly important. And I think it's something about you know the fabric of the show is that we see that not only in Ben, but we see it in other characters as well. You know, we see it in Magic, we see it in Ian, we see it in Jen, we see it in Addison. Mm -hmm. We see their resilience. You know, and we see the things that they have you know had to to fight against. Whether it's something that happened before the story ever started, or 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 if it's something that is you know integral to 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 the stories that we're seen on television yeah um and i think that's the bonding agent too i think mm. we've all all of us in the quantum leap world have come together on on this sort of bedrock of being othered in in a way and therefore want to make a better world for everybody else because they don't want everyone to feel that and and it's a group of extremely resilient people who have been able to stomach all of it and is trying to create a better world for those who might not have the same sort of, you know, bandwidth to take all of it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I, I think that that is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> I mean, I do. I think that that's wonderful. I think it's one of the things that is so incredibly moving about it is that, you know, you, you, you start to realize that you're not alone. And I think that that 
is is such a wonderful and empowering feeling. And I think that it can help to cultivate a lot of that resilience and a lot of that empathy because you look around and you can kind of say, you know, hey, you know, somebody might somebody might not like me, but they can't not like all of us or something like that, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, or if they do, it's okay because we've got each other. Um, mm. um, you know, and, and speaking of that, and, and, and again, that, that you need to kind of go back to the question that I asked a second ago, the, you know, the inclusiveness of the show and seeing a cast that, that, that I think is not the picture of, of, of a lot of other casts that we see on television or we see on screens um, has certainly been an important part of the show for me. And, 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 and I've loved just what it's, what it's added to the storytelling and the possibilities. What does it mean to you to be a part of you know, such an inclusive cast? And, and, and I mean, even for yourself to, to not be, I think what's expected of a lead on television as unfortunate as that might be. Um, it, it, I don't know. It's been incredibly moving and important in my opinion to, to see. And so I'm, I'm curious as to how you feel about it. Um, I feel exactly the same. I also think it's extremely important and I, you know, going back to how much the show teaches me, I, you know, take, take Ian's journey, for example, before meeting Mason as a person, <clears throat> I've maybe known a handful of, of they, thems of, of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, of, of trans people and personalizing it, having a, creating a personal relationship with Mason and knowing Mason's personal story and bringing that into the character of Ian and dropping that in to another layer of Ian and Ben being best friends. Like, what did we come together on? Of course, you know, there's a chemistry and a friendship, but what did we come together on that is at our core that we got to understand each other so well that we were, we're best friends. And it just makes you look at the world differently. It just challenges you to think about everything you thought you knew that you were like, this is an absolute truth. And to be like, Wow, what I thought I knew was not what I knew at all. And, you know, uh, uh, I'll use uh, our, our episode with, um, I'm really bad at episode names. <laughs> I'm just, I just do them. <laughs> um, and I'm also right. bad at like the number of, uh, but I know that it's the, it's the episode with the siblings uh, in, in, the, in the second season. The family treasure. Two the ten. family treasure. <laughs> And there is that speech that, that yeah. Dean gives. And that was something that I talked to Martin at length about, because I was like, the way that it was written on the page, I understood it to be like informative, but I was like, okay. I, I felt like we could go either two ways with this speech where it could just be like, Hey, this is what I am and accept it. Or we can use it as a real teaching moment. And, you know, I, some, I just uh, creatively when I watch projects and when things are very like Ted talky, I have a knee jerk reaction to it. That is not positive. And I didn't want it to be that it needed to be deeply personal. And Martin assured me that like, Hey, uh, we'll look at this again, but just know that like whatever the text ends up becoming, the message is so much more important. And the text ended up perfect, right? And, 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 it, and it was shot so beautifully. And I feel like the, the sun, just the way that everything hit in that moment, it just like, it, it was beautiful when we shot it. And it was, it was be just as beautiful to watch it. Um, yeah. But Martin assured he's like, how great is it that we get to do this with our show? that our show stands for this on network television mm -hmm. on, on uh, uh, where our, 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 our main viewer base might not know any, any people in with this background mm -hmm. and being there in that moment, speaking and listening to that truth and being with Shakina and us all just kind of being in tears afterwards. I'm like, our so it's, it's so special. And yeah. we get to, we get to do that with this show <laughs> with Addison's journey. You know, you think yeah. you have an idea of what an army intelligence, someone who's worked in army intelligence might look like. And you go, yeah, yeah, I, I get, but then to actually see the sort of meticulous 
the meticulous nature of what it means to have served in that capacity and also to serve outside yourself. At the end of the day, if we didn't see Addison as a character, if we didn't meet Caitlin as a person, we wouldn't even know what army intelligence looks like. But he is army intelligence personified. And we know that they're okay with being an anonymous person who helped all these people evacuate out of Afghanistan. Yeah. But now we get to put a face to them. And I, I am just so blown away that I, I get to learn this much um, while I get so much credit for um, <laughs> doing a good job. I'm like, you know what? The credit's all really to the writers and, and everybody that is involved in keeping this show going because uh, they created this, you know? Uh, Stephen Lillian and Brian Wimbrandt, they, they, they brought this cast together purposefully. They handpicked every single one of us, you yeah. know? And, and for that, we are forever grateful. Um, because they, they knew that again, they, 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 they wanted, they created the world that they wanted to see. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, it's interesting. Um, so many, so many questions spring from that, but you mentioned something right now that, you know, it's a question that I've not had the opportunity to ask often. Um, I actually spoke to Steven very briefly before the show had ever aired. Um, you know, he actually reached out to me, um, and, and we had a brief, you know, conversation and, and I just thought, Oh, I'm so excited. You know, this, this show is coming. Obviously there were, there were changes though, you know, after the, the initial pilot was shot, was there ever a moment for you when, um, you thought, oh, this isn't what I signed up for, or or did any of those changes, you know, was, was there anything daunting about that? Or did it just kind of feel like, well, this is my job, I'm going to go and I'm going to do this, and it's going to be what it's going to be? Yeah, I mean, certainly, when the studio and a network wants a new pilot, you're like, why? What's wrong with the one we made? <laughs> That's the right. script that we all fell in love with. That's the script I said yes to. Um, and they want another one. Uh, and then uh, you realize, okay, they're sort of, they're just going for just more action. They, they, they wanted, they wanted a love story up front. Mm. They wanted to, excuse me, mm. they wanted to show the life before. And, um, you know, I, I'm, 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 re I'm I, I, I don't respond to change in the best way, right? Like it takes me a little bit of time. I go, okay, it's, I thought that was our pilot. I loved what we we made. That's the pilot that got our show uh, uh, an order, right? Like, so I, yeah. I don't understand what's wrong with that. So, yeah, my initial response was, I don't like it. I don't, I don't, I don't like this new version. <laughs> um, and then you do it, and then you go, okay, well, if this is the direction that we're going, yeah, I'm game. You know, I, I I didn't see, I didn't see this coming, but I'm I'm game. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that, uh, uh, I'm. I was happy to embrace it, but I, I did initially the script that I fell in love with was, as you know, what became episode six. Right. Well, you know, one of the things that, that I, I had the unique perspective and, and I know that I was, I was a rarity among this, but I actually got the pilot script in February uh, of what was that? 2023 now, 2022, 2022. So I got mm -hmm. it before it had been shot, you know? And, um, and, and, and when I received it and I read it, I was like, I love this. And yes, you know, I want to see this and, 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 you know, this is exciting. And so <laughs> it's a reaction when I heard that it's like, yes, they shot it. It's been ordered. They're, they're going to shoot something else now. I was like, but, <laughs> but, but why, what, what yeah, happened? Exactly. Like I was, I, I was upset. And to the point where my former co-host and I, we actually, we actually did an episode of the podcast and then we decided not to actually release it because we felt like we were just too like doom and gloom about the whole thing. We we're like, nah, we can never release that because we were because I, there was this part of me that was just like, what are they thinking? Why are they making mistakes? You know, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it was perfect. It yeah, was perfect. it was everything I wanted it to be. I still stand um, by that episode. I I I love that episode. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I just thought it told such a, a beautiful story. And one of the things that I did love about it that I know that they changed is that I love that we didn't find out that Ben and Addison were engaged until the end. Yeah. You know, I love yeah. that that was something that came at the end. I thought that was so cool. Me um, too. You know, one of the other things, of course, that the script did at the end uh, is that, you know, Sam Beckett is there, right? And, and, yeah. and, 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 you know, the idea is it's supposed to be, you know, Scott Bakula and everything. 
I, you know, for me personally, I felt this way before the show ever aired. I feel even more strongly now is that, you know, as much as I love, I mean, obviously love the classic series and I've been doing this podcast for six and a half years and love Scott Bakula and learned so much from Sam Beckett. I, I just have never felt like the show has needed that because it, 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 it stands on its own so well and tells so many wonderful stories. And I've fallen in love with Dr. Ben's song. You know, I've fallen in love with all of these characters. For you, however, I'm curious as to what your, and you know, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but I'm curious as to what your thoughts are on the fact that there was that appearance by Sam at the end of the pilot script and the fact that, you know, that Scott's not involved with the show. Oh, the script that I got didn't have Sam at the end of it. Oh, okay. So I had okay. another version of it. Yeah. Um, had I read that version, I would have thought that was that would be fucking incredible. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's the best way to pay homage. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was you know just truthfully it was it was a complicated uh journey that i had to go on in my mind to to know that you know uh it's it's hard to live up to anything right especially something that was so special to so many people and um you know the the general response was you don't need to do this you it just just leave it alone um mm. Uh, but I saw something in it that were, I, I thought I could do good by it. So that's why I said yes to it. And, you know, in yeah. the beginning I was like, well, I'm going to, I should go back and watch the entire series. So I should, uh, so I know. Um, and I started doing that <clears throat> out in Vancouver when we were shooting the pilot and it just, it was not good for me because I found myself mm -hmm. trying to do a, a, a reenactment of Scott Bakula and, that's never good. You know, I'm not doing a, a, a biopic here. <clears throat> I'm creating a whole new character and a whole new story and the world has changed. Um, so, you know, I, I watched as much as I thought it would serve me. And then I, and then I put it away for good. Actually, I haven't mm -hmm. gone back and revisited it because it just wasn't serving me. Um, yeah. but with that said, with, with, uh, the episodes that I watched, I got to, to, to get the heart. And I think that's what's the most important. And I got to have many conversations with Deborah, and she informed mm. me and, and they instilled me with the confidence to know that the heart is carrying through and, you know, you're doing a good job. But, you know, I, I feel like it took, I don't know how it feels like from your perspective, because um, you're deeper in the cut with that. But <laughs> for me... Like it's felt like it took 30 episodes for some, some original fans mm. to come around, <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that is true. I, you know, it obviously it didn't, it didn't take me long at all. Uh, uh, I mean, I was pretty much sold right away just because there were so many wonderful moments in, in, in the premiere episode. And I loved, you know, what, uh, something that has stuck with me since, you know, watching the episode for the first time. Um, and again, I was lucky enough to have a screener. So I saw it before, you know, it actually aired. And the the thing that stuck with me the most is you made me feel safe today. And when mm. you, you know, when, when Ben says that to Addison, there was just something about that, mm. that I was kind of like, okay, yeah, that's I, all right. I'm, I'm, I'm going with this. Let's see where mm. we go. And then, and then with episode two, it was, there was this awe this giddiness you know that ben had over being in space and i was just th that childlike quality that you mentioned earlier about like with clowning and everything it was just like oh i love that you know that's that yes that's that's my leaper right but the episode that really really turned everything for me was somebody up there like spen the third mm -hmm. episode when you and john chafin are in the jail cell and that scene i i mean literally after i saw it i just was like that's quantum leap like <laughs> i don't care I, I it's not i don't it's not 1989 quantum leap but whatever quantum leap is that's what it is right there that moment and that was what changed everything for me um not that i again not that i wasn't in right like of course i was but that was the moment i felt that in that moment as well i yeah. i felt like okay, we're, we have, we're guaranteed this many episodes to explore and to, to explore who, who Ben means to all of this, the relationship, this leaper to this world. And just like you said, uh, episode two, I got to really discover as Ben, like, wow, 
this is leaping. <laughs> this is time travel. This is crazy. <laughs> and then the reality of having to actually do the leap sinks in and you start personalizing, you start creating relationships, you have to play detective and you have to put it all together. I'm like, this is fun. This is cool. This is fun. Okay. But there's, we're all going to die. Uh, so we should try not to do that. Um, and then, yeah, episode three, beautifully written by Drew um, in that scene. And what's incredible is that John and I have worked together before in a, oh, in a really? workshop. We, we did a, we did a workshop awesome. of a play together for a week. And uh, so when he showed up on set, when I saw his name on the call sheet, I was like, oh my gosh, John. And then I saw him in the makeup trailer and we just like gave each other the biggest hug and we looked at each <laughs> other and we're like, this is going to be fun. This is going to be fun. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, and he gives so much as you, as you see in that scene, he's just like, you can yeah. see the, the torment. You can see it's not hard to act when you're across somebody who's giving you that much. And he also, I mean, I love it when our, when our guest cast can really fill out the world and he was in the seventies, you know, he had the, he had the walk, mm -hmm. he had the swagger, he, 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 you know, and I was like, this, this, this just feels right. Um, and, and what we shared in that jail, jail cell was, I felt like, oof, this is, if, if folks are watching, this is, this is what our show can do. Um, yeah. yeah and, and so I felt that, uh, uh, those three specific instances that you just met, I, I felt all those instances as well. Yeah. That's probably why I did too. Um, <laughs> You know, one of the things that's so lovely about the show is that you, you get, especially I would imagine for the guest actors, and I, I've had the chance to talk to a couple of them, but um, the opportunity to come in and tell these stories and, and kind of be this, you know, the, the co-star of the movie, right? You, you, you know, whereas that's not what happens very often with guest stars on television shows. They're, they're you know, certainly kind of just like you come in, you do the thing, you're gone. Um I mean, certainly John is one of those people that it's like, oh, gosh, like it's it's too bad that that Ben has to leap away from this because I want to stay with, you know, with this character for a while. Sure. Um, one of the things that I've heard and I spoke to Nadine Ellis recently, who played Connie in, in The Outsider, and she was phenomenal in the episode it's and nice. just it, just a joy to talk to. Yeah, she talked about how you create just like such a welcoming vibe and space and about how how cool you are you know just somebody to like to, to be around somebody to to to, to work with how, how do you how do you do that and why is that important to you i think it all goes back to theater honestly mm -hmm. um you know when you go through the theater department you have to take every single class i had to wash <laughs> all of our grad students underwears after their performances i had to go up there a hundred feet up to the grid and hang lights. You know, I had to paint the yeah. set. I had to strike the set, you know, and then you grow an appreciation as it's designed to do for every single department. And you realize that it takes everybody here to make a great show. Um, you can't mess around during tech, you know, like the inclination <laughs> to do that and to want to, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not the most patient person. I can't just sit there forever, but they just expect you to kind of like hold your position while they light you. And then they set the cue, but you realize you have to know that this is for everyone else. This isn't for you. This isn't rehearsal for you. And when you come into a production with that sort of understanding that every single person here on set is not extraneous and they all serve a purpose and they're all on a payroll and they're all here to make this scene that we're about to shoot the next 30 seconds, the most important thing that's happening right now, you just kind of have a, a good idea of how much everyone's focusing or should be focusing. And I just want to let everyone know that their job is important. Uh, in however way that shows up on the day right? or even yeah. before. And and not just because I want the day to go well, but because I do recognize it. I deeply recognize it. And like you mentioned, for a show like ours, where it's so guest star heavy, if I don't take the responsibility of creating a safe space for who is about to be my main scene partner for the next seven days, it's not going to do anybody any good. Our episode's probably not going to be great. I know for me, I work the best uh, from a comfortable place. Um, sure, I've had directors try to 
you know, kind of uh, throw me off balance and that might make for a good scene, but it's definitely not going to make for a good arc. Uh, it's not sustainable to, and yeah. with the sort of uh, schedule that our show demands, you just kind of have to get comfortable really fast. And you're probably not shooting the first scene ep- of the episode. Uh, we're not shooting in chronological order. So you have to be sunk in right away. So I, I do try to make it, um, you know, a, a point to, get to know them. And and I do have a deep interest in, I like, I love actors, you know, I, mm-hmm. I, I do, I, I do. I love, <laughs> you know, I love talking acting and I'm, I'm a total geek for this stuff. And I love different processes. Every actor shows up with their own process. And, you know, just as Ben plays detective, I play detective and saying, okay, does this person want to run lines or, okay, they just, they got their own thing going on. Okay. So, oh, that's a warm up. Okay. That's not, they're not, okay. They're just, they're getting into character. Okay, cool. Um, do they want to have lunch? They don't want to have, they don't, they're, they're going, they're going to their trailer. Okay, cool. I'll go, I'll go my trailer. I have to, and our show is very specific in that way where if they don't do well, the episode doesn't do well. Um, yeah. So, and luckily I'm already in a position where I, I'm, I feel like, I don't know. I, I, I like to just create a good safe working space also for myself too. You know, I, this is where I have to spend all my time and I don't want it to be a, a, just a, a, a shitty work environment, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah, I, 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 and I deeply love everybody that works on our show too. So yeah, perhaps that's what they see or, or feel. Well, I mean, again, it's something that I've heard, uh, you know, even not in, in conversations that I've had with people, but just, you know, in, in reading other interviews or, or you know, it, it constantly comes up. And um, I think it, it, your, your explanation, especially relating it back to theater, is obviously something that I can 100% relate to. Everything that you said, I did every single one of those things too. You know, it's like, yep, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. And it's true. And, you know, one of the things for me that's always so incredibly important, especially during those times of tech or, you know, when you're when you're in dress and you're, or you're opening or whatever the case is, it's just like, just to take a moment to say thank you to the people that are you know, doing all of those other things that aren't out there getting the applause at the end of the night. And to also let them know that it's like, no, you are getting those applause mm-hmm. because I wouldn't be getting those without the work that you were doing, you know? Absolutely. And I, and I, it's the reason why, like, I love, I love like talking with costume designers so much because it, it, you know, it, it, it's like, they don't get to necessarily get that same appreciation, you know, in the moment, but it's, but it's so important to me, the work that they do, because it's, 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 it's everything, right? It's like, you think about the way that we look and the way that we dress ourselves. And it's like, that's that person's job, you know, for your character now. And it's yes. like, so what the, the choices that they make are going to inform so much about what the audience thinks about who you are. And, and so I just, yeah, I believe so strongly in everything that you said about the importance of being able to create that environment and create that safe space. Speaking of which, you know, I think over the past five or six years, past decade, but really these past five or six years in particular, we have been inundated with stories about non-safe working spaces for, you know, a variety of reasons. And, you know, whether it's, it's, uh, has to do with some bit of, uh, violence or, 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 you know, with, um, you know, sex pests, you know, for lack of a better term or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, how, how do you kind of, because the safety and and that trust is so incredibly important to be able to do your best work and without it, it it's so hard you know you cannot help but feel that that guard and 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 how can you feel vulnerable vulnerable otherwise so i'm curious as to you know what what it means to you to have that environment provided for you but also how you you know project that how you help to create that safe space um it's a lot less of a conscious effort uh, as you might think, uh, I, I, I'm not always like, how do I create this? How do I, how do I make everyone feel warm and welcome? It's really just about, there's a ripple effect that happens that I, I noticed very quickly on. If I'm tired very quickly, I will start seeing people yawning. Um, uh, and, and I'm just like, okay. And I've been fortunate. <laughs> uh, I've, I've had some great number ones in my life. Um, and I've had, and I've seen like, you know, a couple like not so savory ones, but I just go, okay, well, that's, I know I don't want to be that. Um, mm-hmm. But for instance, um, name drop, when I saw Tom Cruise work, 
I noticed, of course, he's incredible in everything he does. But what I what stuck out to me was his level of energy and how that fed to everybody else. Like, yeah. I don't know what he looks like when he's in his trailer or, 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 or whatnot. But when he's out, the moment he is visible to everybody else on set, he is he is present and he is communicating and he is engaged. He's trying to find the best way to tell the story. He's talking to the camera operators and being like, hey, does that swing around here? Is this seeing me right there? What do you think? How did that look to you? Oh, it's very collaborative. It's like, okay, so then when this happens, I, I, I would like for it to come over on this way. Does that, is that okay? It's like just, and he's like kind of eating things to make sure his energy up. <laughs> You know, I'm just like, what is that thing? Is that some coconut jelly? I don't know, but I think I want that. Um, it's just, you know, you see that sort of example set forth and and you go, okay, that's a page I can take. Um, and it, it honestly took me, I think, like the first five episodes to kind of figure out a good place to work from because I hadn't ever had a schedule this demanding before. And I was just kind of um, depleting myself by the end of the day. And I, I, I think it was not informing the work well. And so mm -hmm. I started working out in the morning. Every day before going to set, I wake up, I do my workouts, and that would fuel me. That would get me to lunch. And then I found out that during lunch, if I just have my lunch in the room, I can take a quick 20-minute nap, and that's going to fuel me for the rest of the day. And that's just what I stuck to. And just having energy really increases your your ability to take in everything um yeah. and to get my eight hours as well so i don't it was never a thing for me to be like i'm going to create a positive working environment but i just know that if i'm taking care of myself hopefully people can see that in the way that i saw it in in mr cruz to be like he didn't have to tell me how to behave, right? Yeah. He just showed me how to behave. And that was very uh, helpful, especially to have right before doing this, where yeah. my first time being number one. It's, uh, it was, I'm so grateful for that experience. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine there are too many better examples to probably have. <laughs> especially in that energy department, you know? Right, right. And the, and, and the um, longevity and, and the, the durability, you know, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, and someone who is clearly so physical and, 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 you know, and takes pride in, in, in being able to do all of those crazy right. mission impossible stunts and do, you totally. know, and, and, and yeah. Uh, uh, the, the movie's fantastic by the way, not that I'm yeah. giving anyone new information, but, um, <laughs> uh, and if there is a third one, uh, I, I, I hope that we see your face a little bit more. Me too. Um, <laughs> um, so moving away from that, um, which I really appreciate you, you, you talking about that. And I, and I understand exactly what you're saying. And I think that it's one of those situations where you kind of have to secure your own oxygen mask before you can secure anyone else's. And if you do secure yours, you know, it's, you're going to be able to have the opportunity to do that and, and, and to have, you know, that, that empathy and, and, and whatever else you might need, the detective work, like you were mentioning, um, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, again, I, I don't want to keep you too long and I certainly want to move through a couple of other things. So I'll skip forward a bunch because season two has been, you know, I think just such an incredible story on its own. And, and, and by the time we get to the end, of course, you realize just how much season one has informed so much of season two. Um, but that said, uh, the circumstances for creating season two, obviously were very, very different because you didn't get a break. You didn't, you know, you didn't go away and come back. It, you just kept going, but not only did you keep going, but Martin also decided, Hey, you know, what would be really interesting. Three years have passed. Everybody thinks Ben's dead. Addison's dated a new guy. Let's go. What were your thoughts, especially as you mentioned earlier, that change sometimes is not, you know, so I'm curious <laughs> as to what you were thinking about all of this. Um, when, when you heard about the changes that were coming in season two. I think when Martin told me, I just took like a really long pause. <laughs> I just was like, <laughs> wait, what? This is a, so this has just become a marathon. Okay. I thought <laughs> generally how this works is you end a season, you get a break and then you, okay. So I, th I had to do some just negotiating with myself and being like, take a deep breath. Okay. Create some more space for energy. Um, but in hindsight, I think it's one of the greatest things to happen to our show 
for what for that for what that time was um yeah. because we were already we were we were rocking at that point and we we really were in the pocket um and uh you know i don't know if that's uh something that, that the audience was able to feel but i mean i really feel like towards the end of the first season especially that finale i was like i think we're we got the show in terms of yeah. what we're good at and um, and I loved what Martin and Dean proposed to had to separate Ben and Addison. Um, and I, and now that we've already established what quantum leap means, how do we invest in the relationships? And that's something that I've always wanted. You know, I, I'm, I love character driven stories. Um, and here we are finally getting to tell the character chapter. We've established the world and now we get to tell and then we get to go deeper into character. And then with the addition of Eliza and Peter, I was like, okay, we're just further galvanizing our legitimacy in the storytelling that we can be capable of doing. And to also have Eliza's experience as being another great number one on a, on a sci-fi show. Yeah. You know, it's another great page that I got to take from her experience too. So in some ways, and I, I don't think I've ever told her this explicitly but she was sort of a mentor to me <laughs> you know what i mean like this is just and also she never told me how to do anything it's just by way of watching her conduct herself if you see her the moment they yell cameras up she is up she she's not mm -hmm. dilly dallying around taking the last sips of her coffee um you know finishing her conversation it's like that is the most important thing that needs to happen because we need to make this day and i i asked her i was like uh, i noticed like you just wait for that bell to ring. You're just there. And she's like, yeah, if I don't do that, then the, the rest of the cast will follow suit. You know, the, if, if I sit there for another five minutes and the camera, the camera operators already are loaded up and doing this, it'll show that that's not important. So I want everyone to feel that that's important. So, um, yeah, sorry, I, I I sort of veered off a little bit, but when they initially introduced right. that and the 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 idea that we're going to keep going, I just I know that I had to really take a deep breath and go, okay, this is this is going to be great. This is going to be great, and it turned out to be great. <laughs> It definitely did. And I'm so glad you brought Eliza up because uh, that was going to be the next thing that I wanted to talk about. Uh, you know, when I, I've spoken with Eliza a couple of times now and, you know, the first time, one of the things that fascinated me and, and, and it just kind of, you know, moved me as a human being is she talked about the place that she was in before she came on the show and about how she had been a little nervous and she'd had a little bit of a lack of confidence and she was doing, you know, self tapes for the, for the show because she couldn't make it in to, to actually, you know, be in the room with you and all this sort of stuff. And, and so the, the first like read that you guys had together was done through zoom right mm -hmm. yeah I mean, yeah that that's kind of incredible it's incredible it's it's mind-boggling to me you know to the and i know that it happens but that she was having this crisis of confidence because her work in the show and especially in the last couple of episodes are ju is just mind-blowingly great but like how how did that work for you and how did you know that that's the right person you know over zoom right and not being able yeah. to be in the room with her <laughs> yeah i mean i don't you know, I don't love Zoom. I think as as much as everyone, I don't think anyone really loves Zoom over a, a, a personal cup of coffee with someone, right? But yeah, uh, it is still effective in relationship uh, in in developing relationship. It is still two people talking to one another as we are, and. Um, Actually, the chemistry read with Caitlin was also over Zoom, you know, and oh, wow. yeah, yeah, so we we find that we are able to establish chemistry over Zoom and to I think it also served her to also be on Zoom at that time because that was the first uh, in-person auditions since COVID that we have all experienced. Uh, the only people mm -hmm. in that room were Martin, and Dean, and myself. And Martin and Dean were both double masked, not shaking any of the actresses that would come in. You know, you just like, you just have to, it was like the, the infection rate was really high at that time. And this was even a gamble that we were willing to see actors in person. And mm -hmm. just as we were out of practice, so were these other actresses. They were all out of practice. So we were all just freaking nervous. Yeah. <laughs> like you know, we, we weren't able to do. And then you have your two decision makers sitting there, like just <laughs> all you could see are completely imperceptible. Just like, uh-huh, yeah, that, that was great. 
That was really good. Uh, can we do that again? But, uh, it's just like, it's, I was nervous. My, I'm like, what if I suck? Like, what if, what if I don't put my best foot forward and I can't find Ben's song for them? I don't want to let them down. Um, I was just going, we were all going through a lot. And then, you know, Eliza shows up in a safe space. Right? We're like, yeah. ah, computers. Okay, we know this. We've been doing this for the past two years. <laughs> um, and I think, uh, you know, and when you know, you know, and she was just, uh, clearly so Hannah, uh, and you know, she drops in like that, you know, and <clears throat> I think what's beautiful about actors and artists in general it, it is that sort of vulnerability that we all carry that like, we all think we could suck at any moment. We were always teetering on that line between like, e like egomaniac and like complete like loser. <laughs> and, and some, some magic happens right in between there somewhere, you know, and yeah. you kind of need both too. You got to think you're the best. And, and then you got to also be like, man, I suck to really rise to that occasion when you have to. But yeah. I, I, I we saw vulnerability in her. We saw everything that, that, and we saw, uh, we definitely saw Hannah and we all fell in love with Eliza as everyone does. So it's just, yeah. um, it was pretty clear. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you see her in, in the third episode of season two, I mean, at least for me anyway, and then that music plays and it's just sort of like, okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm in. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I love too, and you, you, you touched on this with the character driven story of season two is that we, we got these incredible moments, um, you know, especially between Ben and Addison early in the season and episodes three and four in particular, um, you know, episode four, another great guest star, right? And Tim Matheson and episode three as well with, with Lewis Hertham. I mean, and, and that's another thing where it's just sort of like you guys had such great chemistry and it's just like watching you and the sheriff and it's just sort of like this is awesome you know yeah. um but but the the story that that you know was told with with ben and addison um there were some incredibly emotional scenes you know with you and caitlin and uh her scene in lonely hearts club where you're on the the sidewalk and and you know and she finally just says like you know i waited i almost you know jumped into the accelerator all that sort of stuff she told me um when i had her on the show a, a couple of months ago that it was that episode in particular was very difficult for her because she also realized that she was kind of she kind of felt like she was saying goodbye to her friend by the end of it because she wasn't going to be the observer anymore i would love to kind of get your point of view on that because it again like it was very, you know she she said it was really hard it was kind of sad she didn't you know she didn't really like shooting that scene at the very end of the episode for instance where you guys say goodbye what was it like for you also the same um yeah I, but i you know i also understood that as i you know i just have a little bit more uh hours logged in terms of knowing that this is just like it's temporary, you know. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's not real. We can still go have lunch after, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what, Caitlin's so incredible at is she's she sort of lives. She's she's method and she doesn't know it sometimes. And and it's mm -hmm. it, and it's it, she and and it, I, I think her also being so close to Addison and just in terms of their background and, you know, their occupation and what they've done before and how she's always had to be in service to some, I think it, it, she's working from a very honest place. And of course you're saying goodbye to the person she's, you know, I have the most hours logged with her out of any scene partner I've had in my whole life, of course, to hmm. come to grips with, this new reality that we're not going to be just spending actual physical time together is a bummer, but I knew that it was great for story. So while I was yeah. sad to say goodbye, you know, or see you later, um, I was also <laughs> thrilled at the prospect of knowing that she is developing her own entire arc. Like she is now getting to in the physical world, getting to f be in love with somebody break up with somebody, uh, you know, work with somebody, bring another person in. And like, almost now she is the number one in her own story there. And I'm like, I am so thrilled for you, Caitlin. Like, this is like amazing. Um, and I know she saw it that way too, but, um, yeah, we did have a wistful goodbye. <laughs> you know, we were like, <laughs> we, were, we were watching, uh, I, I distinctly remember our holding was like, um, 
on the other end of the soundstage and we saw Tim Matheson doing his last scene before he was, uh, before he was wrapped out. Uh, and it was just him in the car, uh, doing some, some inserts in the car. Mm. And, uh, Caitlin and I were just kind of in the dark and we sort of looked at each other. And we're like, going to miss you. I'm going to miss you too, <laughs> you know? And, um, again, it, it informs the work. And it, it, I think it all ties back into it. And yeah, those scenes were difficult to shoot because um, the, 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 our, our, our argument scene, uh, we haven't ever had to speak to each other like that with that sort of intensity and sort of like trying to hurt is, is an intention that both of us weren't used to doing with one another. Uh, and, and putting ourselves first was not something that we would do a lot with each other in that way, emotionally. Right. Like, mm -hmm. so it was, it was, it was hard. Um, but such is the nature of the, those scenes and, and, and the, the arc that it built and look how incredibly, uh, <laughs> deep the world got because of that. So, uh, I, yeah. I, I totally feel what Caitlin felt too. Uh, but I also felt like a little bit more of like, but this is great. Like, this is so great for sport. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, you, you got to go to Egypt. Like, what was that like? <laughs> I wish I could tell you. <laughs> it's a whirlwind. Like, yeah. it's just like, you know, uh, completely surreal, right? Like you don't expect, I mean, it's a bucket list destination as it stands alone. And then you add the, the added uh, of being able to work at the foot of the Sphinx. And you're like, mm. this isn't real. This isn't real life. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And you're just so grateful for everybody who was able to make that happen for, for Dean, who essentially dreamt that wrote that into existence. And then you go, Whoa, mm. this is what we're capable of doing. And here's a show that it makes sense. You know, we're not law and order all of a sudden, you know, trying to bring somebody to justice in Cairo. <laughs> we are <laughs> we were there, you know, um, and so I, I, I just, it was one of those surreal moments where you go like, wow, this is, this makes sense. It's not outrageous in the way that uh, other shows might ma make it out to be. Uh, I love that we're able to do that. Um, but also it was four days of just go, 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 go. And yeah. sort of the real show was on the other side of the camera when you're watching trailer or first AD and Grismer and, and all the local crew just trying to wrangle all the civilians to be like, don't enter the shot, you know, like, you, yeah. please, like, it doesn't make sense to them. These, this is the bazaar where they walk through every single day. And you're like, no, you just can't come this way. Why can't my shop is right there. Um, these are the things that I was lucky enough to all watch and be like, okay, this is, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now we have to act. Okay, cool. Um, also the added pressure of having to get the shot because now we have this tiny window where they actually were able to halt traffic. We got to get it. Um, uh, it was intense. Uh, I don't know that I got to like enjoy Egypt for sure. for you know what i mean uh yeah. but it did serve as an incredible location and backdrop for the story that we got to tell yeah yeah i mean just being there alone i would imagine just it definitely adds something you know i yeah. I, I could only imagine like the feel the vibe of that yeah and um, you just don't want to be dwarfed by it too right you you don't want mm. like you know like the star in this shot is clearly the pyramid you know, the star in this shot is the Sphinx and I'm just kind of serving as decoration, but you got to also remember like, okay, but you don't want to disappear into the background. Like you, you, you right. need to show up for that. And that's a different kind of thing to use the Sphinx as your scene partner and what, mm. what that might mean. So that was a challenge that I didn't anticipate, but yeah, that's really, yeah, that's really interesting. If we had more time, I would ask you more about that. Uh, but see it as we don't, and I want to, and I do want to ask you just a couple more questions um, that uh, I, I'm going to skip to the end here, so to speak, because one of the things that's so beautiful, I mean, against time, I said this to Drew, I said this to Chris Grismer. I mean, I, I just think, I think it's perfect. I really do. I just think it's perfect. And, um, you, you know, the, the story that gets told and, and, and as we, you know, started this conversation, choosing empathy, choosing compassion, you know, over destruction, over hate, um, is just such a magnificent 
thing to leave people with. Uh, now, of course, on the fan side of thing and, and, and just being entertained, right? We also got just some incredible stuff that we got to see through the course of this story and, you know, the payoff of so much of the arc that's been set up for the season and, and truthfully, the entire series, really. And I think that, you know, it's one of those things that Drew had hinted to me a number of times. He'd, he'd said, like, I'm telling you, you know, that you're going to want to go back and watch everything, you know, not just this season, but last season. And 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 then all the pieces kind of come together. And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I get it. Um, so for you, I know when you got the script uh, that that you would you'd put something on Instagram. <laughs> about how the writers were crazy and <laughs> yeah. uh and, and drew drew had mentioned that you had you know sent him a message after you read it what was it like getting that getting that script and reading that for the first time i couldn't put it down i it was like <laughs> whoa whoa okay whoa whoa um <laughs> and it's never stopped being whoa i just i yeah. I, I, you know, e even now I can't articulate that feeling of being so excited <clears throat> for something where, you know, there aren't so many certains in, in what we do, right? You, you, you know, you rehearse for a play and then you just hope it goes well. You hope at this moment, this joke lands and then you just kind of hope for it. But yeah, I also have learned to just like trust in all the, the pieces that were built that, that this was all constructed in such a way where this, this episode would just really be incredible. Like I, I and I, I knew that it was something that we didn't have to push or force or really do anything else with, because I, I just, I remember I closed my laptop and I was like, I need to text Drew. And, and then I need to text Martin, I need to text Dean, I need to text anybody who is involved in making this to let them know that I will do right by this. And it's not anything that I need to do extra of, right? Like you've already built everything. Now I just have to go say those words. And I, I, I had never been more excited to shoot an episode in my life. Um, and it's just also, you know, the whole team was there every day. You know, the Martin and Dean were there. Uh, we had um, some of our other producers there every day. And it was like we were all watching this thing happen in real time. We were shooting the scenes. We were getting the coverages. And we're just like, oh, my gosh, Connor. Connor's so good. That was amazing. That was, that's going to be so great. <laughs> oh, Judson. I can't do Where'd you find Jud Judson's? Judson? Mm -hmm. Judson. You know, every component about that episode was like we'd shoot it and it's like, James doing his scene, uh, our, yeah. our scene together, just, you know, his, his energy is so sporadic and it's, you don't know how he's going to respond. And the moment he comes out of the, the imaging chamber to, 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 to see where he's at emotionally, you know, everybody brought it. And I think everybody knew how special that script was. And we, <laughs> uh, it's the single most, it's the single best episode I've ever done in my life. Just best in the most general sense. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm so proud of it. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I can't find better words to articulate because I'm still really, you know, we just watched it. Uh, we had yeah. a viewing party two days ago and uh, I'm planning on watching it back again because I am a real fan of our show and I, I love watching our episodes too. And it's one that I know that I have to set aside time for and just like just to watch as a fan. Um, because, yeah, as you mentioned, the, the tying up of all the story pieces uh you know, bringing Susan back, bringing Georgina yeah. back and uh mm -hmm. It just felt so epic. <clears throat> Magic shows up, epic, like one liner, boom, like just like just like just hot, hot one liners all over the place. Uh, <laughs> I think like you know a Jen getting shot and dying, like yeah. just I feel like there there wasn't a moment wasted. There wasn't a scene wasted. Not to say that we've wasted scenes in the past, but it was. It just felt like very cinematic, and uh, I think it really showcased our everything that we're really good at. And there was yeah. so much payoff. Um, and like you mentioned, it's it's tying in season one with everything where we've been establishing in season two, and 
it is just uh it's a, a beautiful hour of television yes it is yes it is and it's and 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 every one and everything that you just touched on is you know a part of, of that and and i i love the fact that you know that yeah james is just so incredible as gideon that scene between the two of you it's just it's shakespearean you know what i mean like it's like oh my god and 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 obviously you know uh wyatt wyatt parker uh um plays uh jeffrey i mean the scene between the two of you outside of the garage is heartbreaking I mean, time is a thief that is that is you know in, in burned into my brain forever now I mean, wyatt i, I just have watch. to say a special shout out to wyatt because uh he's good like he is he's <laughs> good in a way where he has just great control of his instrument and he knows what the story needs and and uh his ability to also like he is a talk about cool he is a cool dude he's like you know like not <laughs> he's had the and i think the experience shows for it you know like he, he just he he knows what the scene is he doesn't get flustered and you you ask him to give more he'll give you more he'll he'll give you and he knows how to get himself up to what this moment means and i i and he has a such a bright future yeah it's so funny because chris said almost exactly some of the same things that you just really said about about him yeah 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 you know especially with like being able to kind of like take the direction do that you know yeah so that's that's i mean wonderful. i watched I mean, it all happen <laughs> i was like right <laughs> you did that and then you gave more like you put some extra right. on it. thank you okay we're going we're yeah. going there well, like, it, you know, and even in um, the, you know, the episode prior uh, as the world burns, when he reads the letter, it's one of those amazing moments where it's like, he doesn't say a word. And mm -hmm. literally there are mm -hmm. things happening between you and Hannah, right? Like, I mean, you know, Eliza's doing her thing and everything. And he's just sitting there reading that letter. And it's just like, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. I, I love those moments in general, like seeing, you know, acting between the lines, or in this case, just in silence, like, it's just like, he is in it you know he is absolutely 100 percent in it. It, it like caitlin has a similar moment in the family treasure where you guys are in the caverns and the camera is just focused on her and there's this conversation happening with you know the three of you behind her but it's on her and she's just telling the whole story with her face and it's mm -hmm. like i just love i love that stuff so much Me too. um you know and 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 yeah and you i mean you get to basically say goodbye to to hannah and you know and at the at the end and it's such a beautiful scene i mean the lighting the you know i mean i mean anna is just so wonderful at, at, at doing that and it's just it looks incredible um and then of course you 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 leap and we get the amazing stuff back at hq and addison leaps i just i just need to know what were you thinking during like the filming of that, that little short bit where you're, you know, it's it, all of a sudden you're in Europe, World War II, you're standing there thinking, you know, all this stuff hasn't worked. And then you look over and see her, like, what was that moment like for you? Because it is, I mean, even talking about it, I'm just getting a little perclimped and I'm thinking of the music. I'm thinking of everything, the way Caitlin looks like it's just, it's, it's so perfect. Yeah. I, it was one of those scenes where I was pretty nervous for in the sense that, you know, I, I talked about how I, this script is so good. You just have to trust that all the pieces were built to support this story, right? That in these moments and that the payoff is going to make sense and it's going to feel right. And this was, you know, as far as the journey of Ben and Addison goes, the most important scene in, in, in this, in this season, uh, in my opinion, um, because we're seeing the culmination of the, the, the stories that we both paved individually. And now we're coming together. I just, I was like, this has to be right. And I, it's impossible to know when you're doing it, if it feels right, right? Like you're, you're there and it's something that you haven't done before and you know the, the reaction that it's gonna get from everybody who's been following their journey and you just wanna get it right. And so there's a, it was an immense amount of pressure to get it right. And then at a certain point, I was like, I trust it. I trust everything that we've built, just release into it and do whatever 
you don't plan out anything just you know of course you know you're moving from this mark to that mark but whatever's going to happen between you two just let it happen and i remember <laughs> like our bodies colliding for the first time <laughs> and us like not knowing what it was way more awkward than what what made it on the day because it was like <laughs> like, like like almost like, are you like, what is like physical? Are you real? You're a real person. I remember holding, trying to hold Caitlin's hand and it was just like, what is this? Like, how do we, I don't even remember how we used to hold hands. And then it eventually evolved into something that was just more tender and, 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 and lived in. Uh, and I, I, I wanted to make sure that if it had that feeling of, you know, when our, our, when our hands meet, that it feels precious and lived in and familiar and new. Um, it's hard to do all that. Um, and, you know, I just want to make sure it, it came out right. And it's hard. I, I even had a hard time believing, uh, you know, when Drew would run up with tears in his eyes, he's like, that was perfect. I'm like, dude, that, <laughs> no way. Like, I, I really, that's, that was good. You know, I'm, and I think that's what the scene actually really needed. This, this sort of, this feeling of being displaced in the best way and a, a mix of emotions where it's like, I had just said, Ben had just said bye to Hannah just right before. And then here's mm -hmm. Addison. And then how do I play all of that? And the answer was, you don't have to play it. You're just going to feel it. Because also Caitlin as Addison is bringing all of her history. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I have to applaud Caitlin's work all throughout this season and the season before and how she's crafted Addison's journey. And, you know, my God, did that scene feel right? You know? Yeah. Uh, and it was just gorgeously shot. Um, the, the hats off to the background. The background were great. <laughs> they were really running yeah, yeah. from danger, <laughs> like right. colliding into each other. You know, um, I, yeah. that's a great point though, because it, seeing that makes it even more poignant when you and Addison run towards the fire, right? Like mm -hmm. seeing these people scrambling behind you, running for their lives. Like if that right. wasn't there, you guys running towards the fire wouldn't be, you know, yes, it would still be like, they're running towards it, but instead it's just like, ah, they're running toward, you know, it's, it's, yeah. Incredible. Yeah. And I'm so I grateful for, for, uh, Grismer and Drew's direction there too, because initially I think we were both playing it like, like we got to go save this fire, like in a very dire way. But he's like, they were like, why don't you add a hint of like, we're doing this together. Like, oh <laughs> shit. Like, Hey, we get to, we're, 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 we're a superhero duo right now. You know, like this, right. this, this is going to be fun. And then to just add that, just that, that sparkle. Just that, like, just even yeah. a smirk. Uh, I mean, watching it, I was like, <laughs> the music. Yeah, I, like, yeah. I know, <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. absolutely. And I just want to, you know, I mean, I, I do this a lot, quite frankly, because I think she's fantastic. But I just want to give Caitlin her props, too, because everything that you said is so true. And the fact that, like, there are so many times, and I think it's partly just knowing that this is, like, her first job, basically, right? And so, you know, you, you, you watching throughout season one, I would often make comments about, like, oh, it's so great to see this actor grow and see, you know, just see her become more and more, and you know, and she's phenomenal and she's doing this. And then there's that moment where we get the flashback to the very first episode where you know y y you're talking about quantum entanglement and seeing caitlin's face it's just sort of like you dumbass she's always had it she's like, always like, had, she it. had it yeah, from day yeah. one like totally. like it's like sure everybody grows everybody changes but like she had it then and 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 now and it's beautiful um one thing that i heard i, I had the opportunity uh to to get this from drew is that the the final line um when she says don't let go okay and you respond i won't that wasn't in the script where'd that come mm. from just like i like i told you i was just responding you know i mm -hmm. I, I stopped trying to control that scene we i think we were both and that's the, and that's exactly where Ben and Edison are, right? They, they both were trying to control their own destinies, trying to control each other's relationship. And in this moment, they're finding themselves both helpless 
in a sense, because we don't know what's going on. There's no holograms there. We have both no information. We're both helpless together. And trying to control this in the way that we were like almost wrestling with each other and being like, no, let me hold your hand. No, you hold my hand. Like I, no, let me embrace you. No, wait, let me point you this way. It wasn't, we both had, there had to be a letting go process where it's like, if we fall into each other, this will, it's the, the, if the only way this would work is if we fell into each other and don't let go. I won't felt like, just the theme of this entire two season arc um, and going back to the quantum entanglement of holding hands. That's a, that was a tight grasp, but immediately after Ben lets go. So I thought without thinking too deeply, like what a great theme to go back to. I love when things end at the beginning Mm -hmm. we're embracing each other, telling each other we're not going to let go. And the possibilities of us letting go then presents itself again. When someone promises something, those are the hardest things to uphold, right? Um, so, I mean, I guess I'm, um, for the first time, thinking about it now. But perhaps those are all the things that I felt in saying that, um, also just a genuine response of not wanting to let go of this friend that I have been so, yeah. so missing and longing to see. So. I love that. I love that. Um, is love infinite? We hear that a couple so. of times this season. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Love is infinite in the way that home is up for interpretation. Absolutely. Um, last question, you know, as a community, when we lost Matt Dale, it had a big impact on me. I, I love and miss him dearly. He was a great friend and, and somebody who serves as an inspiration and someone that I try to honor. And, and, and I had asked this question once before, I believe, to Eliza, actually, she was the first person I'd asked it. But since Matt's passing, I've been making it a regular thing because it just feels right to do. Um, and so I just want to know in, in closing, what inspires you? So many things. Um, and it changes, mm. you know, it changes, it certainly changed when I had kids, when I had a kid, um, you know, your priorities change. Yeah. And you're therefore your what inspires you and what gets you up every morning changes too. Um, currently, what gets me up every morning is trying to get to the gym before the kids wake up so I could take them to school. <laughs> but that's the thing, right? Like, I want to make sure Absolutely I take them to school. Is. I want to, and that's why I got to get it in on my time. Because that's my most important thing that to make sure my kids grow up okay and that my family is taken care of and it sort of feeds into the work that i'm interested in doing um you know that's not to say that i, I will always portray somebody with great values it's you know this this that's not going to be the case um but i love that for this period in my life right now uh when there is so much uncertainty and the world seems to be collapsing in on itself that we can be a part of something that um, inspires hope. And uh, I love the fact that I get to be some sort of a conduit for that currently. And it inspires me in a way where I'm having to at times go outside of myself to become a better person for those around me. Um, so right now <laughs> yeah my kids are my inspiration the future uh their future is my inspiration uh me being a good father is a, a great inspiration for me <laughs> i just i i have to be good be me being a good husband uh and a good son um 
But, um, and, uh, you know, I, I can answer that question in so many different ways too, right? Because creatively what inspires me too. But I think overall, um, I just want to be an inspiration for them in some kind of way, if I can control that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess that's what currently inspires me. That's beautiful. And I can't thank you enough for that. And I just want to tell you that your work has inspired me for a while now. And I can definitely safely say after having this conversation that you inspire me as well. And I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. That, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's very warming. Thanks so much. This has been a dream. It really, really has. <laughs> and there's so much I never even got to. I wanted to ask about, you know, Theater World Award. And, and I wanted to ask about One Night in Koreatown. And, you know, there's so much more. So I can only hope, whether I have to beg, borrow, steal, whatever the case may be, that we get the chance to do this again sometime. Um, don't say goodbye. <laughs> say see you later <laughs> i i think this is a, a to be continued situation um i'm very uh, optimistic i i think uh i think the the journey of our show isn't over which means uh our relationship is also not over <laughs> so i think <laughs> I, I i i i want to, uh, i'm i'm very optimistic and and in knowing that those questions will be answered one day and, and uh, we'd have uh, many more things to talk about with upcoming episodes too. Well, that sounds fantastic. And I would love that. And I feel the same way, um, you know, as, as a total outsider, I'm, I'm optimistic. So I, I just, I feel good about it. And, uh, and I can't wait for what's next. And so I will definitely say, see you later. Uh, in the meantime, fellow travelers, thank you so much for joining. Uh, I hope you had a fraction uh, of the amount of fun uh, and insight uh, that, that I got out of all of this. And uh, I will definitely be back soon with more. But in the meantime, take care of yourselves, take care of one another, stay safe out there. And remember, unlike maybe Dr. Ben Song, always, always leap responsibly. <laughs>